Welcome to Michael Potts F1, everything Formula 1, the film photographer's point of view. Round 4, the Japanese Grand Prix. This year, the race in Japan has been moved from typhoon season to Sakura season. We are just in time to see the cherry blossoms bloom over Suzuka. While it did rain on Friday and Free Practice 2 saw hardly any running, with the conditions being wet but not wet enough to tempt the drivers out, race day was glorious. This is a much better time of year to host this race and hopefully it will be at the same time again next year. Free Practice 1 all of the attention was on Racing Bulls VCARB Visa Cash App Racing Bulls team, or whatever it's called, where they elected to run their young driver earlier in the season than expected. Red Bull Jr. Ayuma Ayawasa took Daniel Ricciardo's car for FP1. This was the first time two Japanese drivers had appeared for the same team since 2006, where Takuma Sata and Sakon Yamamoto raced for Super Guri. Ayawasa has been in the Red Bull Jr. program for a number of years, and was fourth in last year's F2 championship. He is currently driving in Japan's Super Formula, and it's great to see that he's still on Red Bull Honda's F1 radar. He does need a big season in Super Formula if he's to get into Formula 1. During FP1, he finished 16th, which is a solid performance. Unfortunately, it was nearly a second behind his more experienced teammate, Yuki Tsunoda. Racing Bulls can't use Liam Lawson for their young driver tests, as a driver needs to have driven in no more than two Formula 1 races, and Liam has started in five. It was an interesting decision to give Ayawasa a run now, considering how much Ricciardo is struggling. You'd think that he needs all the time he can get in the car. That lack of running was exacerbated by FP2 being written off, giving Daniel only one session to prepare for qualifying. And while he was beaten by Yuki, and Yuki did make it into Q3, the time difference wasn't that much. So that's a little bit encouraging for the Australian. However, on the first lap, he cut in front of Alex Albon, knocking them both out in spectacular fashion. This was disastrous for both drivers, as it put Williams in a very difficult position. In the winter season, Williams opted to develop their car right up to the last minute, not giving themselves enough time to build a spare chassis. That gamble bit them in Australia, where Alex had a huge crash. He ended up having to take Logan's car, as there was no spare available. This weekend, both Alex and Logan have crashed, meaning more costly repairs, and an additional headache because both cars need to be shipped back to the UK to be checked and repaired before being flown out again to China. This is a huge cost, and it's really going to be eating into the team's budget. For a team that is already under a lot of pressure, this was the worst result they could have had. And for Ricardo, this crash is only going to add further pressure. He came into the season with aspirations of earning a Red Bull drive. Now he's fighting for his survival at Racing Bulls. And there's talk that he could be replaced by Liam Lawson before the end of the season. In China, the team are giving him a new chassis. Hopefully, with that change, he'll also have a change in fortune. He is getting regularly beaten by Yuki. But that has a lot to do with just how well the Japanese driver is racing this year. He has been outstanding scoring points in his last two Grand Prix, and in 2024 that is no small feat because the top five teams are so far ahead of the bottom five teams that they basically lock out the 10 scoring places. This effectively means that the 10 drivers in the bottom five teams are racing against Lance Stroll for that final point scoring position. Helmut Marko did say that Yuki was driving at the same level as Max Verstappen, but you feel that if a seat ever became available at Red Bull, the bar for Yuki has been set so much higher than all the other candidates for that seat. Speaking of Red Bull, there is still a lot of speculation over Sergio Perez's future. Despite the Mexican having a great start to the season, three second places so far, just one blemish in Australia. He did have some deep discussions with Helmut Marko as the pair arrived on Saturday, and you have to say that he did everything that was expected of him. He was very close to Max in qualifying, and he drove very well for another second place. Considering how difficult this track was for him last year, and if you've forgotten what happened in last year's race, here is a link to my video from 2023. Perez has had a huge turnaround in six months, and the team have said that it's his seat to lose. And you have to say, he is performing excellently. But that didn't stop Red Bull from flirting with Carlos Sainz, who was in deep discussions with Helmut Marko on Sunday before the race, 
and during the celebrations, he was having a great time with Max on the podium. Is there a chance that he could return to the Red Bull fold? Let me know what you think in the comments below. For the start of the race, I decided to shoot from the grandstands. I was looking for a little bit of a different shot, something that would be a little bit unusual for the start of the race. Sadly, this wasn't the best spot, as I completely missed the crash. But we did get two starts in the race, so I moved to a more traditional head-on for the second start. It's an amazing experience having these cars hurtling towards you at the start of the race, hoping that they all get through the first corner okay. Suzuka is a fabulous circuit to photograph. The move to a spring date is such a good idea. We did have Sakura, the famous cherry blossoms. And there was a spot where you could get a photograph of these and the cars on track. It was also in the grandstands, but it was in a special section that I think only Suzuka has. They have sections throughout the racetrack dedicated to fans who are photographers. With a special ticket, you're allowed to bring a full professional spec DSLR massive lens monopod the works and photograph the cars from some brilliant vantage points. I do think this is the only track that does that, and I really think all other circuits should offer this because it's a wonderful opportunity for aspiring photographers. And it's also a lot better for the other fans who don't have a massive lens blocking their view. Anyway, this shot is taken from one of those areas. It's rather an iconic Japanese scene, and it's, it's one that we're very, very lucky to be able to capture because it is exceptionally fortunate that the cherry blossom season coincides with this race. I got these shots during qualifying, but I do regret not going again during the race because with the blue sky, they would have been even better. One of my favorite shots at the track is the whiteout shot. Here, I'm photographing the cars as they come through the second degna and underneath the bridge. You expose the shot for the darkness under the bridge, and that whites out the background. I shot this from both sides of the track, but I think I prefer the outer side because the car is a little bit more head-on. Which do you prefer, inside or outside? Before I took the outside shot, I was up at the hairpin for the start of FP3. And in the first part of the session, Magnussen went a little bit wide and lost it a bit on the grass. Luckily, he was able to keep control of the car and get it back on track. But it's quite cool seeing all the mud being thrown up by the car as he fights to get it back on the circuit. Another favourite spot of mine is photographing the cars as they go through the chicane. Here you can get the observation wheel, or the crowd, or the cherry blossoms in the back of your shot, and it's a great place to play around with depth of field. If you go a little bit further around to pit entry, you can get a cracking shot of the cars coming into the pits with the massive observation wheel in the background. There is a speed limit in the pit lane, and sometimes you see the cars locking up their brakes before they hit the limit line. While in the pit lane, you can also get a very cool shot of cars reflected in the shiny surface of the pit box. This changes quite a lot depending on the day. For example, this shot was taken on Friday, and the stands weren't that full, so the reflection is quite white. I took it again during qualifying, and you can see how much richer it is now that the stands are full of people. We had the return of the Apex film crew. Here's a shot of the team's fans meeting drivers as they come into the paddock. They're waving big Brad Pitt heads around. A few of the acting fans also had Apex cars attached to their hats, trying to capture the spirit of the Japanese fans. But I don't think they're as good as the real thing. Japan has, hands down, the most excited, the most committed, the most passionate Formula One fans of the entire circuit. It's amazing to see all the outfits that everyone's got. Here are some of my favorites. So there we have it. It was quite an interesting race behind the two Red Bulls. The Ferraris were beaten by Landon Norris in qualifying, but they did have much better race pace. Lots of teams trying different strategies, two stops, one stops, aborted one stops, but Charles Leclerc pulled off a great one-stop strategy to finish fourth, and he had a nice new lid for the race. But it was Carlos Sainz again, the faster of the two Ferraris, and claiming his third podium in three races started. He is driving so well at the moment, it's almost like he's driving to save his Formula One career. And here is some breaking news. Fernando Alonso has re-signed with Aston Martin. His press release just says, I'm here to stay, Fernando Alonso. And that's putting to end a lot of speculation about him potentially moving to Mercedes or Red Bull. Thank you so much for joining me for the Japanese Grand Prix. I really do hope you've enjoyed it. Next one is Shanghai. So until then, 
goodbye.